But right now, let's talk cocktail party and SEC with Florida great SEC network analyst Chris Doring with us on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. What is up, Doring? How are you today? Oh, man, it's good to be on with you, boys. What, what, Jim's taking off for the bye week? Is that what it is? Yeah, Bama, Bama on a bye, Dunaway on a bye. Yeah, right? his, his team doesn't play. He's out. No, right. he, went, he went to Vegas for not one, not two, not three, not four, but five nights, Doring. That's aggressive. That's aggressive. Oh. I, I, I uh, You guys know, I mean, we were together in Nashville uh, a couple years ago, or last year, I guess, for media days. I extended that to seven nights, which was Ooh. way too aggressive. And I feel like five in Vegas is equally on par with that. Yeah. yeah. Seven, in, right seven in Nashville, that'd be a lot. I, I made it our five oh. in Nashville, and I told you, this weekend ain't happening. <laughs> God bless you. You were literally the last one. You shut the lights off when everybody from SEC Media Days was gone. Hey, I, do, I was on fumes, bro. It was terrible. It was a bad decision. I, I do want to ask you, though, because we're going to get into the cocktail party here. Um, I've been one time, and it was a long time ago. It was back in the 90s. It was when Florida was really dominating the cocktail party. Um, did you ever stay in Jacksonville? Were you guys ever allowed to stay there and, and like, have a night after and then come back to, to campus on Sunday? I love that you asked that because it would never happen nowadays. But back then, Coach Spurrier let us stay. If we won, we got to stay. So, obviously, my, my junior and senior years, we played those games in uh, Gainesville and in Athens. But my first couple seasons uh, as part of the, the Florida team, man, we'd stay over there, beat Georgia's ass, and then stay and go out <laughs> to the landing like the kings of the city, man. <laughs> I, I mean, that's it. extra motivation. Yeah, what a carrot on a stick right there for that's a college the most kid. For, for like 18, 19, 20-year-olds to be able to stay with all the, the girls that are going to be out after the game? Are you kidding me? It's uh, the best motivation now, to Now, out. did they put you up in hotels? Were they like, you got your no. podium? Okay. You were on your own. That was one of the things. The bus took off, and then you were on your own to be able to – you better have somewhere to stay. You better have some people to help keep you under control because, uh, again, that would never happen nowadays. Uh, let's talk about this game, though. Like, it feels like from Birmingham, where we are watching, that it's turned a little bit for Florida. I mean, I think people are starting to talk themselves into this Florida team playing improved football and maybe being able to be a spoiler with – Texas or Georgia or somebody down LSU this incredibly difficult stretch that they have to end the year I think a lot of people during are talking themselves into they may be able to pick one of these games off now it's crazy to think about the roller coaster of emotions Florida fans have been on in the last two and a half months I mean heading into the season I think a lot of us including myself were very optimistic about what season three would look like under Billy Napier's tenure they come out and get embarrassed, physically dominated on both lines of scrimmage by both Miami and Texas A&M. And then all of a sudden, you, you see some improvement. And the improvement that I've seen is on the offensive and defensive lines. The defensive line penetrating, uh, uh, being disruptive against Tennessee and against Kentucky, going out there and moving that Kentucky defensive line off the, the line of scrimmage and, and allowing Jaden Baud to rush for over 100 yards. I, I think what you're seeing is hope. And, and hope is one of the most powerful forces in our universe Florida has hope because of the improvement of the, the team in the last couple of weeks, but also because of the young talent that's really leading this resurgence. You look at uh, DJ Lagway and what he's been able to do, you know, completed only seven passes against Kentucky, but hit four of them for over 40 yards average, I think 35 yards of completion, something like that. And then Jaden Baugh, the other freshman that I mentioned on offense that had so much of a contribution. Trey Wilson's only a sophomore. So I, I think you're seeing – you know, a, a situation where Florida thinks, well, do we want to move on from Billy Napier now? I mean, especially with all these young guys that have been recruited, clearly he's got an eye for talent. And these guys, every one of them you talk to talks about the love they have for Billy Napier. So I, I just think it's turned into one of those things like cautiously optimistic again and almost like what could have been if Florida would have scored some points in the first half of Tennessee – You'd be looking at five and two and probably a team ranked in the top 25 right now. Okay, Doring, I've changed my tune a little bit on this. I used to be, look, these guys are making $10 million. You give them a $25 million buyout. I really don't feel sorry for you. It's so up and down now with all of the transfers coming in and how you've got to balance NIL. So I think you've got to be a little more hesitant, a little more patient. Coming into the season, everybody had already fired this guy. You've now yep. won three of four. The one setback – and maybe this is a little bit on Napier. I think we all agree he should have gone for two in that situation. But still, um, a one-possession loss in overtime to Tennessee, like, I almost wish Scott Strickland would come out and say, you know what, he's fine for next year. Your coach for next year is going to be Billy Napier. I think internally that would help things out there. Am I completely wrong on that? 
Lance, I, I would say it's interesting because I didn't think it was about a number of wins this year. I, I thought it was about the aesthetics. I thought it was about improving, you know, what seemed to be disorganization on the sideline. Uh, it, so it seemed to be, you know, a, a, an offensive or defensive line that didn't match up with the best in this conference. And I think after the first couple of ball games, you're looking at, well, I don't see a whole lot of improvement. You've still got 12 guys out there on the field goal attempt before halftime against Tennessee. You, you, you're getting pushed around by some of the, the better teams in the country. And, and and at that point, I think a lot of folks thought that, that Scott Strickland might move on from Billy Napier. But the problem was, and maybe this is the biggest indictment and also the best benefit for Coach Napier, is that who are you going to turn the football team over to? I mean, there was really nobody on that coaching staff that you looked at and said, this is a solid guy to be the interim coach the rest of the way. So I think they had to be patient. And now with that patience came, uh, you know, a little bit of life from this team. They seem to be playing harder. They seem to care a little bit more, taking ownership. The, the, the coaching staff seems to be doing a better job of understanding, you know, roles and, and responsibilities. So I, I do think it, it, it does require a, a little more patience in this day and age. But honestly, like, I don't even know what a good coach looks like in the transfer portal NIL age. I think that's still yet to be determined. Like what characteristics, what what do you have to have as a coach to be able to survive in this new age of college football? It's an interesting question. So Florida State, look, any anything's on the table in today's college football. I mean, anybody can literally beat anybody. We're seeing it week in, week out. You feel like Florida State to win, which gets them to five. I mean, if they were to win one of these other games, Georgia, Texas, LSU, Ole Miss, and go six and six, Nobody expected six and six, right? Yeah, I mean, Vegas had it at four and a half, as I sure I know you know, Lance. And, and uh, you know, I, I pushed in on uh, over four and a half. I thought it was a lock, and now I'm sweating a little bit. But, <laughs> you know, I, I think, um, I think you, you look at two things. I think Florida's improvement is a factor, but I also think there's a lot of inconsistency, a lot of teams that are flawed, a lot of just average teams this year in the SEC. So I, I do agree with you. I think Florida should be able to go to Tallahassee and beat this team that's just pathetic up there in the state capitol. Uh, but also, I, I do think that they're able to get one or two as you look at, at Georgia, Texas, uh, LSU, and Ole Miss. Uh, the last two come to Gainesville. Uh, all of them look look beatable. And you know, I look at even Texas. Like Texas's offensive line, I have concerns about them. Not only did did Georgia have some success last week? Vanderbilt had four sacks. They were able to, to pressure Quinn Ewers. Like, I don't think there's anybody that's necessarily invincible. So if Florida can eliminate the self-inflicted wounds, I actually think that they can get to six and maybe even seven wins this year, which would be crazy to think about after that Texas A&M loss a month ago. Chris Doring is with us. He is on the JohnstonRVCenter.com hotline. You uh, see him on the SEC Network here on Sirius XM. I, I would like to ask you about the other side of this game, though, with Georgia, because it feels like there is something missing here with Georgia. I know I'm just talking about a team that went to Austin and won. You know, they came all the way back against Alabama and took the lead. So, you know, they're, they're a miracle play from Ryan Williams maybe away from being undefeated. I get all that. But when I watch that team, it just, it just doesn't feel like Kirby's normal teams. What are they missing? Yeah, it's part of the, the esteem that we hold that program in. I mean, the yep. expectation level is so high that I think we're inevitably setting ourselves up for a little bit of disappointment. But I, I, I thought, you know, heading into the season, Carson Beck was the best quarterback in the league. He has looked inconsistent like so many of the other quarterbacks in this conference. The offensive line is not as, as, as good as what it's typically been under Kirby Smart in that, that offense. The receivers, I think you're starting to see some guys step up a little bit. Arian Smith has developed into the, the deep threat that we thought he would be. But you start the game, Dylan Bell drops two in a row against Texas. Arian Smith hadn't caught the ball much more consistently. So uh, it, it, the running game hadn't been there. They, it definitely feels off. I do. I have more confidence in the defense. But even them, like they're giving up a ton of explosive pass plays, which we typically don't see. So I, I, I think as Florida looks at it, you know, you can you can create a little bit of penetration like you did against Tennessee and, and Georgia, or excuse me, Kentucky. You can force Carson Beck maybe into turning the football over. And then remember, Dan Jackson, the safety for Georgia's out the first half from that targeting call uh, against Texas last uh, game out. Maybe you're able to hit some big plays. Badger's been tremendous in, in that uh, uh, receiver position. DK has been as well, both transfer portal guys. Trey Wilson seems to be healthy now. So if DJ Lagway can – can be consistent throwing the football and not turn it over. I think there are some some paths to victory. I'm I'm not a moral victory guy, but I I just want to see this be competitive. I want to see Florida 
get into the fourth quarter and have it be a one-score ball game and see how things fall from there. All right, I find this report interesting, and I'm just going to give it to you in real time. You could 100% be aware of it already, but I do want your reaction. (coughs) Brett McMurphy, who covers college football for the Action Network, because of the renovations to Everbank Stadium in Jacksonville, in 2026, this game will be played at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta. And in 2027, at RJ Stadium, which I assume is is the old, wherever the Buccaneers play, I guess that's the name of it now, in Tampa. So it's going to two pro stadiums. Your reaction to that, because you played two campus games the last time the old yeah. school Gator Bowl was being renovated. Yeah, isn't that interesting? I mean, the push from Georgia's side has been to make it a home-and-home home series, and yet when we have the opportunity or have or forced to leave Jacksonville, it goes to two neutral site games. Yeah. I, I, I think that you know kind of undermines some of the argument maybe that Coach Smart has about why this game should be moved to campus. But you're right, uh, Ryan. I, I, I did get to experience in Jacksonville a couple of years. I got to have the Bulldogs come to Gainesville. I got to go to Athens. And while it was a novelty – to go get a chance to play between the hedges, it felt like every other SEC game. And in a day and age where the college football landscape is changing so much with NIL and transfer portal, we got to be able to hold on to some of the fabric that makes this game so great, that makes this league so great. And so keeping it in Jacksonville is is important to me. And maybe this is a signal. I mean, obviously it's about money, right? And and the money is going to ultimately, you know, rule the the day and the decision that comes. But this is a game that that is, is that just deserves to be there in Jacksonville. Once that stadium's back, it'll be awesome. But uh, I, I do think it's interesting to see that that's been decided upon or the reports that's been decided upon because I think there have been some back and forth. What needs to change, Ryan, though, is let's change the recruiting rule. Let's let's let yeah. both teams have recruits on, in Jacksonville. Like, let's show those recruits. Like, anybody can go play a home-and-home home series, but there's very few that get an opportunity to play in a game as special as this. And I think having that – opportunity to bring recruits to Jacksonville is a much better selling point than switching it to home and home. And that, that has been Kirby's argument. I mean, that's at least what he's based his argument on is we lose a critical recruiting weekend and Florida does too. I mean, he's always included Florida in that, but he obviously cares about Georgia recruiting. So that's been his objection to it. Yeah. But doesn't that seem like a much better recruiting tool to get yes. them over there into that environment? Like I had the luxury of growing up around that game. So I knew all about it, but you bring in somebody in from, Another part of the country. You think Brock Bowers knew anything about Florida, Georgia, and no. Jacksonville when he was growing up in Napa? Like, I think it's a great time to, to show why you want to come to Florida or Georgia to be a part of something as special as that game. You mentioned pathetic when you talked about the state capitol in Tallahassee and what's going on with Mike Norville in 2024. And, you know, I find it funny, CD, that in the offseason, I had, I, I said, I think Florida State's going to lose four games. And people thought I was insane. And now they're sitting there at one and seven. And it, by my calculations, I did a deep dive. I think there is only one team in the history of college football that has had a 23 game plus minus turnaround. And I think it was Southern Miss in 2011. They go from 11 regular season wins to going 0 and 12 the next year. There is a chance Florida State goes from 12 and 0 in the regular season to 1 and 11 if they're unable to beat Carolina and Florida to end the season. What do you think he's – I mean, I know quarterback plays bad, but it ain't just quarterback play. What is going on right now in Tallahassee? Yeah, first and foremost, I'd like to say, you know, the program, the city, I think is pathetic. They do a great job recruiting co so I want to give them hype about that. <laughs> the, uh, the other thing that uh, I look at, man, you talked about patience. Like, uh, Florida State forced, were, were forced to be patient with Mike Norvell because they didn't have the buyout money that they needed after paying Willie Taggart his big buyout. And so – they, they didn't have the luxury of, 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 of changing coaches again. And all of a sudden, you get that undefeated season out of nowhere last year. And you're thinking, wow, man, I'm glad we didn't have the money. Then you re-up the contract for some inexplicable reason. And now you're on the hook for even more money to, to, to buy Mike Norvell out. I just think it's, it's so tough. We already talked about the, the challenges of the dynamics of college football now. But, like, identifying that home run hire, the can't-miss guy. Like, everybody was talking about Florida re- replacing Billy Napier – and they were on Lane Kiffin or we're talking about Eli Drinkwitz. Like all of those guys, you're seeing them struggle right now a little bit to some degree too. So I don't know what the answer is. I do know that Jordan Travis, uh, Keon Coleman, the running back, uh, a few defensive players, they, they covered up some of the deficiencies. Like when you have a great running back – or excuse me, a great quarterback. I, thought, I think Kyle Trask is a great example of that. In 2020, that Florida team that got to Atlanta uh, with – 
Kyle Trask, Kyle Pitts, Kadarius Tony. They covered up some of the, the the deficiencies on the roster, and I think that's kind of what happened last year. And I think you're seeing more of it without having that tremendous quarterback play. But uh, so much, like think about, I look at Kentucky in our league. Like they they've missed in the transfer portal with Devin Leary last year and, and Brock Vandegrift so far this year. Gavin Wimson, like so much about football these days is about having the right quarterback. And and even in this league that we thought there were so many good quarterbacks. I, I think they're, the, they're, you're seeing that Nico Yamaliava is still very young. Uh, Carson Beck, who maybe was the best, is is inconsistent. Quinn Ewers has his own flaws. I just, I, I, I all of it depends on how good your quarterback plays. And right now, I just think there's a, a deficiency in really consistent quarterback play out there. Uh, this past Sunday, we saw one of the more, more baffling hail marys that you'll ever see in the nation's capital with the Bears and the Commanders, from high school to playing in the SEC to playing with the Texans in the NFL, have you ever been involved in a Hail Mary that actually worked? N- not one that worked uh, on either side. Um, you know, my catch against Kentucky was only from the 28-yard line. I'd like to say it, it happened more of, of good execution than pure luck. But that – that uh, you, you guys know this. Like, every Saturday in the NFL – before you're, you know, during your walkthrough, you're going through the Hail Mary situations. You're running your, your, your late game scenario plays to get you down the field. Defenses know you're supposed to be offenses. Like everybody wants to be the guy that catches the, the, the ball on the Hail Mary, but you're always supposed to have a jumper. You're supposed to have a guy that's in, in front of the bunch. You're supposed to have a guy in back of the bunch. So credit Washington for, for executing it well, but you're supposed to have the same sort of dynamic on defense and uh, the Tyreek Stevenson thing. I feel bad for him. He said all the right things, but I mean, he, he was a former Georgia and Miami guy, so I, I'm I'm okay with him. And that <laughs> kind of fits the the narrative that you expect from those players. <laughs> I love the fact that Doring will not let rivalries die. He has destroyed <laughs> Florida State, Georgia, and Miami right now. Uh, Chris, we appreciate the time. Chris Doring at uh, C Doring twenty eight on Instagram at Chris Doring on Twitter. See him on the SEC Network. Here in with our guy Peter Burns. Uh, uh, on the SEC Network as well and Sirius XM Radio. Thanks, Chris. Have a great weekend. Hey, hey get done away. I need an update on the casino tables, how he's doing out okay, there. Yeah. Get that on the show, please. Hey, hey, right we, here. He's we, losing. I yeah, can we, we can guarantee he's losing. Yeah. Meant to ask you, the uh, the Peter Burns, were you in the uh, barbecue restaurant the night he almost choked out? I was not, but um, and I don't want to undermine the seriousness of what happened there. But uh, the jokes were flying after we, everybody knew he was okay. Yeah. The the the, uh, the text group, uh, the group text there with all the folks that were in attendance, there was definitely uh, some good zingers that were being like you guys know this. PB, his attention to detail is so low. Like he's always moving on to the next thing. And Commissioner Sankey was in attendance, so you know he couldn't wait to try to talk to Commissioner Sankey. And, and yeah. like they said, the piece of meat that came out of this dude's throat, it looked like he hadn't even chewed it a bit. So that, I think that's perfectly in character <laughs> with what we know Peter Burns to be. My wife overheard me with one of my guys on the phone the other day, and she's like, man, when you're around your friends, you'll just destroy each other. I'm like, that's exactly that's how we show we love each other, right? I mean, exactly. if we're not destroying yeah. each other, we don't love us, right? And that's what that's what the coaches say. As soon as I stop yelling at you, that yeah. means I don't care about you. If I'm not busting balls, but I, that means you're not my boy. That's right. So, I mean, I, just, you know. uh, I don't know how else I show my love for you other than to do that's that. That's right. Yes. All right. Thanks, CD. Good talking to Appreciate you. Appreciate y'all. See you. Right, see you. Chris Doring with us, the uh, Florida great.